Three weeks in October 2002, a time seared into our memories. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid. I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Absolute horror. This isn't supposed to happen in a community like this. As two murderous snipers encircled the Washington, D.C. area, a time when we all realized that our life or death in those 22 days was just a matter of chance. I'm Melanie Alnwick. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Bob Barnard. Welcome back to Three Weeks of Hell, the D.C. Snipers, our podcast looking on that frightening uh, three weeks back in October, 20 years ago in 2002. Uh, we've learned some new things in this uh, in the research for Absolutely. this podcast that we're sharing with you as we go along here. But today's episode is looking back on that very first day. It was October 3rd, 2002, when it became evident to everybody that something crazy was going on in the D.C. region. That's right. And, you know, it was one of those days that you talk about. It was a regular Thursday. It was a warm fall morning, clear and sunny, and it really just ended up like no other ever in Montgomery County. Well, tonight, we have several new developments in the deadly shooting spree that has already killed five innocent people. Three of the killings have been linked to the same weapon, two, two, three rounds. So if you joined us for episode one, you know that we spoke with a lot of different people, and one of the people we spoke with was Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy, who was early on part of the Sniper Task Force. And during my interview with him, he told me he remembers the night before. Uh, October 2nd, uh, just by coincidence, I was on uh, George Avenue. I was driving down to a, to a restaurant I went, would go to frequently called Barnaby's. That everybody here locally would know it. It was a fam famous sandwich place. I was going down to get some to eat, and I was passing by uh, where Mr. Martin, the Shoppers Food Warehouse in Wheaton, near the intersection of Georgia and Randolph Road. I saw the lights, I saw the siren. I was the deputy state's attorney at the time. I pulled in to find out what was going on. Somebody had gotten shot. Seemed to be from a distance. I got briefed on the scene. James Martin, a 55-year-old white man, had been shot in the back as he walked into the grocery store. It was 6.02 p.m. FBI case records say it's believed the shot was fired from approximately 75 yards. Fox 5 reporters were covering the shooting that night in the same way local police were initially looking at it. A very strange, seemingly random murder with no motive. Mr. Martin seemed to be an extraordinary guy, had a federal job. Uh, there didn't seem to be any logical reason for this to happen, uh, but I just happened upon literally the, fir the first scene. The next morning was when all hell broke loose. At 7.41 a.m., James Buchanan was doing a favor for his friends at Fitzgerald Auto on Rockville Pike. A landscaper by trade, he was mowing their grass when he took one shot to the back. Initially, the Buchanan case was reported as, as, as a tragic accident uh, with a lawnmower. He was mowing the lawn for a local car dealer, and when he was found, he had massive chest, massive chest wound. People mistook the chest wound that thought the blades of the lawnmower had flown off, struck him in the chest, because there was no explanation they could otherwise offer for it. Uh, he was literally in Bethesda at the shock trauma center. These other murders began to come in, and the call was made, basically, would you please turn Mr. Buchanan over and examine his back. And when they turned him over, they saw the small entrance wound, which was the bullet that entered, but came out his chest and basically did catastrophic injury to, to the front part of his body. Fox 5 photographers were there on Rockville Pike. Now in that video, we see that dark green lawnmower motionless next to a utility pole while Montgomery County police officers interview witnesses. And then two officers start running toward their squad cars, jump in and speed away, sirens wailing as another victim is falling. That was the murder of part-time taxicab driver Prem Kumar Wallaker, shot once in the back and killed 
while gassing up his car at the mobile gas station on Connecticut Avenue in Aspen Hill. It was 8.12 in the morning. Go handheld, Doug, handheld. Yeah, hi, just one second. Yep, 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 one second, we're gonna go handheld. Well, that was me after just arriving on the scene, barking out instructions to the photographer, the live truck operator um, at the gas station. It was, you know, maybe an hour after the, the killing. It was a crazy scene. Here now is a clip from the first live shot we did the first day of this three weeks of craziness. All right, we've got a live picture now to uh, go with uh, our information. Take a look behind me. This is the uh, gas station, the mobile gas station. The vehicle you can see there is a silver minivan that is behind the police tape. That's the van that the, uh, the nurse was in. There is blood, frankly, on the, uh, splattered on the other side of that van. On the other side of the van, still parked at the pumps, is the cabbie's car. He is gone. He was taken from the scene, but later died. This is where this shooting happened this morning. Um, and this one was at 8, 10 a.m. In that clip there, I mentioned a nurse was driving the, uh, the minivan because that's what police told us at the time. It turns out she was actually a doctor, a physician, Dr. Carolyn Namro from uh, Silver Spring. She's now 60 years old. She's a mother of five. Uh, pretty wild to have you know, been talking about her that day and now 20 years later to have tracked her down. It's incredible how these things sometimes come full circle and people that you kind of knew of then to be able to come back 20 years later and really get to hear from her firsthand her experience and meet her and obviously as you're going to hear here it's it's uh it's still fresh in her mind that morning 20 years ago uh, she was a mother of five kids born in england um and uh she was dropping she had just dropped her three older kids off at school she had a i think a baby at home and a two-year-old in the in the car seat in the back seat of her minivan when she stopped at that gas station to get gas and it was a very warm day. So I opened up the windows of the minivan and I noticed there was a taxi driver to my right and he was filling his car. And he, to me, he was doing something unusual. He was filling the car from underneath the rear license plate, which I had never seen that before. Cars in England don't have that mechanism. So I didn't know what he was doing. So I stopped for a few seconds and I just looked out my window and he looked at me and uh, we sort of, you know, smiled, nodded at each other, and he continued, and pumping gas, and I reached down to get my credit card, and um, then I heard a very loud bang. So for a split second, I thought, well, you know, may maybe he's electrocuted himself, but it was a gunshot. But the, the thoughts went through my head at the same time. It's a gunshot, it's an electrocution. Because I, I, I was, you know, why is he filling his gas tank? And like, what is he doing? You know, that's weird. But... I, I did realize it was a gunshot. And then he, I looked up. So that's, that's why I hadn't got out of my car immediately was because I, I stopped to look at him and I st had to get my credit card out. And then he walked to me. So it was only a matter of two or three steps to my car. And he was at the passenger window and he said, call an ambulance and he collapsed. And, uh, and so I grabbed my phone and I turned around and my two year old was very happy sucking on his pacifier. And, um, my hands were shaking and I got out of the car and I called 911 and I saw the taxi driver was laying down and there was a lot of blood and I was trying to explain to the um, 911 operator where I was and what had happened and um, and as I was trying to make myself clear on the phone um, I saw a police car in the line of traffic because there was a it's quite a busy junction and at that station on Aspen Hill and um, and I saw a police man and it turns out he was off duty anyway I sort of waved to him as I was on the phone with the 911 operator and then I and the operator was asking me these questions and um, I, I just I think in the end I just hung up with her. I can't quite remember exactly what happened but I was really stressed because I realized I have this was all in a matter of a few seconds you know it wasn't very long but I had to help him and then I, at the same time I realized well where, where is everybody nobody's coming out there were people in the uh, gas station shop you know there's obviously a garage where you can get things fixed and then one young guy did sort of come and, and yell to me and say what well, do you need any help and I said get me a first aid kit because I just saw a lot of blood and then I dropped down and uh, I realized that Mr. Wallacher that's the name of the taxi driver was um, he had a few uh, he he had some difficulty breathing um, and um, and then I realized he was passing away it's called agonal breathing and um, 
So then I started to do CPR, and then the policeman came, and I told him to do the chest part, and I said, I will do the mouth part. And, um, and then um, I didn't know where the ambulances were, and then there was an ambulance, two ambulances came, and nobody was getting out of the ambulances. And I said to the policeman, we, we need them, because at that point we needed to suction the airway, to clear the airway. And um, I said, why aren't they getting out? So it turns out later on they told me they weren't getting out because they thought it was a terrorist attack and they were waiting for the all clear. So it felt like minutes, I don't think it was. This was all very, very fast. And, um, and I think at one point, because I was unable to, his airway need, really needed suctioning, I think I ran at one point to the ambulance and yelled to them, get out. And then, um, then they did come out, and um, unfortunately, Mr. Welker had passed away. Um, and, um, and then, all of a sudden, then there were a lot of policemen around. But I, I don't know exactly how long it took. It felt like a long time. I don't, I don't think it really was. But it felt like a really long time. Were you terrified? Realizing, did you realize then he wasn't electrocuted, he was shot? And maybe like the ambulance people, afraid there might be more shots? Or did you, did you not even think that? You just saw someone in need. That. I didn't even think that. I did not think that at all. And I just felt, when I was on the phone with the 911 operator, and I, was, I was really shaking. I was really, really, really shocked. And I knew immediately, obviously, he'd been shot because there was a lot of blood. And I, um, the thing that calmed me down was I had to talk to myself and say, you're a doctor, <laughs> you know what to do. And when you're in the hospital, it's completely different. You have a gown, you have gloves, you have a mask, you have the suction, you have oxygen, you have all your equipment. But this, I was at the gas station, I didn't have anything. So I wasn't, re I wasn't ready, so I had to, tell myself, you can do this. You know what to do, just do it. And that, that helped me just to focus on Mr. Wallaker. And stop, I, maybe I did stop shaking, I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever shaken that much in my life. But I did not think at any time about my safety or my son's safety. I, I don't know why. I just was focused on him. Mr. Wallerker was the second of five people shot and killed by the snipers that fateful day. But that crime scene was where all the top Montgomery County police officials and prosecutors, federal agents, and the media for some reason not only gathered, but stayed there that first day. Immediately after Mr. Mal Mr. Wallerker was taken away, I just felt like there were tons and tons of police everywhere and everybody was wearing a bulletproof vest. And I was standing on the forecourt of the garage and I was looking around and I was like, uh, you're all wearing bulletproof vests and I, I seem not to be. And I managed to call my husband and say, you gotta come, because they weren't gonna let me leave. I said, I have to go now, I have to go now. I have a two-year-old and a baby and I have to go. And they said, no, you have to stay. And then I, I called my husband and he was able to come and take my two-year-old. And then at some point, I think after we did the handoff, that's when I looked around and I realized, I'm still standing here and now there's about 100 police, I don't know how many police officers. Seems like 100. Oh, it felt, and they all had bulletproof vests on, and I didn't have one on. And I said, you know, I, I notice uh, you're, all, you're all wearing these vests and I, I don't really feel so safe anymore. And, um, and then they said, okay, you can go sit in a, in a police car. So then they put me in a police car. Dr. Namro was later told by investigators the 17-year-old sniper, lead boy Malvo, also had her in his rifle sights before he pulled the trigger. It's really hard to think about, um, but I tend to, th I do think about it, you know, every early October, um, because why him, why not me? And just for those few seconds, because they, they did have both of us in the, in the line of vision. And so after, when I was interviewed, after they had caught them, after they called the snipers, they took me to the, uh, I think, it was, I don't know if it's called an instant room, but they had very large posters on the wall of each location. And, and they had gone back and they knew where the car had been parked for each shooting. I guess they do some measurements and they couldn't work it out using physics. So they, um, maths, and so they had these large photographs and then I realized, oh, and I said, oh, he could, he could see me. He could see me which I had not realized until that point. And they said, yes, he could, he could see you. But at that point, you were in the car and Mr. Wallaker was out of the car and he had to make a choice. And unfortunately, Mr. Wallaker was the easier choice. I was behind the glass, but they could also see my two-year-old, they think. But he would have been slightly obscured by the, 
passenger seat that was in front of, because he was in the middle row. It was a three row minivan. But um, if I had got out immediately, grabbed my bag and got out and not being a little bit nosy and what's that guy doing, then it would have been 50-50 who he would have shot. So that is very hard. You know, so what's, what's my burden? You know, in life, you know, why, why me? He was a really good man. He has a great family, beautiful children, beautiful wife. What's really the difference between us? And I, I don't really know the answer. So every day is a gift and you have to think about that and you have to re try and remember what matters, which is, you know, family and friends trying to do the right thing. Later that night, again, this is October 3rd, 2002, I spoke to Mr. Wallacher's son, Andrew, outside the family's home in Olney. I just want everybody to know that my dad was the man. He was the greatest person I ever met, you know, ever knew. I'm glad he was my father. Can you believe what's happened? I mean, you, a lot of other families are grieving tonight, but it, it doesn't diminish your pain. But under the circumstances of this, the mystery, the, the fact that whoever did this is still out there. Yeah, I, I wish they would hurry up and catch these guys, and if they catch them, you know. Uh, I just, I couldn't believe it when it happened. I mean, it doesn't, it always, I mean, it seems it always happens to good people, but when it hits so close to home, it hurts real bad. Like, I, I don't, cannot recover. My dad won't see me have kids, get married, none of that, and he won't be there for me to give advice and, and the previous knowledge that he has already been through, like, you know, to guide me. But, you know, I have family right now, but it's just not the same. That was strange that night because that was the night of, of the first killings and we got the address of the taxi cab driver and the family was all out in front of their home. And, you know, it's often difficult to just approach people at their saddest I was just moment, thinking that. you know, but there was Andrew. Uh, you know, in his football jersey, oh. you know, kindly talking to us, you know, somber, kept it together. Um, it was strange because you look back now and you're like, you know, would I have the gumption to go to the victim's house on a crazy night like that? We often do it, but it's still, you know, I almost forgot that we had done that because there it was fresh and raw that first night talking to one of the victim's survivors. And you're often so grateful to the families for being willing to share that with us and with viewers, it's never an easy thing to do on both ends. And, and those losses for those families, it never goes away. That pain is always there. And we appreciate that 20 years later, for many of these people, it still brings up some very difficult memories, like Dr. Caroline Namrov. I mean, I, I can only imagine what she felt like and what she still feels like, knowing just how close she came. That was incredible to me to hear. And, and it's this whole thing we've been talking about. Like for some of us, it's, oh, I remember that. Where were you? But, but I mean, for some people, it never leaves. For the Wallacher family, obviously. But for Dr. Namro, I mean, her, her uh, two-year-old in the car seat was, is now 22 years old, but it's so fresh in her mind. And she, she was gracious and came in here and sat with us and, and recalled 20 years later the, the terrifying nature of what she had seen. And you'll hear from her in further episodes how it stayed with her her and her family while the killers were still out there because she had witnessed it and was afraid that maybe they'd be coming back after her. So less than two miles away from where Mr. Wallacher was shot, 34-year-old Sarah Ramos sat on a bench at Leisure World Plaza. She was reading a book, waiting to get picked up for a housekeeping job. It was 8.37 a.m. The 911 calls are chilling. We need uh, an ambulance at Leisure World. Okay, we're already on the way. Can you, okay. uh, can you tell me what's going on there? There's a lady that's sitting on the park bench, and um, she's not moving. There's another special police officer here as well, but um, she's bleeding from the head, and she's not moving. Okay. Do you see any weapons laying near her? I just see a purse sitting to her left-hand side. At 9.58 a.m., Lori Ann Lewis Rivera took one shot to the back as she was vacuuming out her van at the Shell station in Kensington. We need an ambulance at the corner of North in Connecticut. A woman was vacuuming her car. Something blew up. She's unconscious. She's got blood coming out of her nose and her mouth. North and where? North and Connecticut Avenue. Across from Kensington. I have no idea. She's laying next to the vacuum cleaner, but she's unconscious and blood coming out of her nose and her mouth. Blood's coming out of her nose and her mouth? Yes! Huge, loud noise like a bomb. The car is the, the guy that's behind the Loud noise like a bomb? Yeah, but it wasn't a bomb. I mean, it was like that kind of noise. It was like, it, a, it was like a gunshot, maybe? 
Here's more of my live reporting that morning with Montgomery County Police spokesperson at the time, Joyce Utter. Obviously, Joyce, you've got a, a crime scene here, one of four in the county this morning. There's uh, Captain Nancy Demi, who's the incident commander there in front of a police car over in the, in the parking lot. The question everybody is going to ask is, what's going on here? Is this connected? Are there madmen running around? Are these possibly connected? But, but if you look at our victims, we have an African-American cabbie, a young, apparently Hispanic woman up in uh, Leisure World. We have a, a, a gardener and then someone down at the uh, gas station at Knowles. Is it just possibly some one or two people randomly going out killing people? We do not know. I'm trying not to panic people, but we do not know. We need anyone who were in those locations last night and today who may have seen a car driving, leaving at a high speed or someone walking around looking suspicious to call us immediately. By noon, four people had been shot and killed, not including the murder at Shoppers Food Warehouse the night before. Again, state's attorney John McCarthy. It was almost immediate because um, you got to put this kind of in a little bit of a historical context. We were only one year away from 9-11. And when this thing went down, it was so random and, there, and the, the shootings appeared to be everywhere. There was a question whether or not this was another form of terrorism. And, and, and as a result of the United States building up efforts through uh, federal agencies, the ATF, the FBI, they had been gearing up to respond to another terrorist kind of activity in whatever form it took. So when this occurred, uh, there was an immediate rallying of both state and federal resources to a location. And we actually were right across the street from where Mr. Wallacher was shot at the gas station there uh, in Aspen Hill. Uh, and they brought in a command bus and we were there in the command bus uh, with one federal agency after another one state agency after another, rallying to that point to try to gather information about what exactly we had on that particular occasion. Obviously, some of the, there had been, as we're gonna later find out in the investigation, earlier activities by the snipers, but as of that day, uh, we were beginning to, to connect the dots. Helping to connect the dots that day uh, and throughout the investigation was Mike Bouchard, who was at the time. I remember that name. Oh, yeah. He with Chief Moose were the two faces of, of the investigation, really. Um, he was head of the ATF's field office in Baltimore. Um, and so this was kind of his area of expertise. He was brought in that morning. He was actually out of town. I had a chance to uh, sit down with Mike now 20 years later and interviewed him from his home down near Williamsburg, Virginia. Yeah, midday on October 3rd, I was at uh, in Ocean City, Maryland, at a uh, Maryland police chief's meeting. And the assistant special agent charged at work with me called me around midday to say they were responding to some shootings in Montgomery County. And um, you know, I asked, you know, are they gang related? Any, any, uh, any way to link the shootings? He said, you know, they're all, uh, all different uh, locations, different types of situations. So I got in my car and headed back to Montgomery County, and I was briefed you know, on, the, on the trip back about uh, additional shootings. Some of the most important evidence collected early on were the bullets fired at the victims. That's Agent Bouchard's area of expertise. Here he is talking about that in a news conference from 20 years ago. Once a projectile is fired and it hits something, it's, it becomes distorted, so they have to take a look at it closely under a microscope, look at it from different angles, and try and compare it with the other ones uh, from other shootings. More now from our recent interview. At what point did, like early on, did you guys start thinking this may be a sniper or someone from a distance shooting these people? Because nobody's reporting seeing anyone running from the scenes. Yeah, by the time I got there later in uh, the evening, it was still before Mr. Charlo was shot, but you know, we looked at all the situations. There were different uh, locations, people doing different things, uh, different race, different sex. So uh, it wasn't like somebody was just targeting a, a certain type of people or it did, there weren't, robbery wasn't involved. Um, again, no witnesses to where shots came from. So, you know, we were starting to think um, it could possibly be a sniper um, shooting from a distance. And what about a possible suspect vehicle? Early on that first morning, remember, the lookout was for a white box truck. Tell us now, if you can, what you're looking for, the latest you have on a possible suspect uh, vehicle. 
in the homicide at the Leisure World Shopping Center, a small uh, delivery type vehicle, box type, Mitsubishi or an Isuzu type truck with small black lettering on the side. And on the rear lift door, there's a dent um, was seen leaving the scene at a high rate of speed, occupied by two males. We are looking for that vehicle. So Bob, you know, we talked about things that we didn't know then. And I think a lot of people assumed that if you have a sniper, they're gonna shoot and flee the scene, right? Right. So well, that would be the smart thing to do. Would be, you would think. So while all of this is going on, it turns out that Muhammad and Malvo actually were just biding their time, staying in place. I learned this from my interview with John McCarthy. I was in the command bus. They were about a block away in the Boston market eating lunch. We thought there was an assumption that the shooter would flee. The reality is they hunkered down and stayed within blocks of where the shooting occurred. They stayed right there. So just hiding in plain they sight. Hide it. They, they were hiding in plain sight. That is wild to think the nerve of these guys to have killed these people and then let's go grab lunch and hang out kind of where all the police and everybody are, are flying by us. Yeah, and the word that comes to mind is hubris, just that they thought that they had this great plan, nobody was going to catch them, that they could just do this at will. And for a while, they, they were did. able to do that. They were able to do that and they just cruised right on down the road, just a few miles down uh, the road to what, just across the Montgomery County yeah, line, Georgia right? Georgia Avenue takes you right into DC, right? They were so kind of through Silver Spring and right into DC. Right, so at 9.20 p.m., they encounter 72-year-old Pascal Charlotte, who is a Haitian immigrant just walking near a laundromat. Yeah, we got a guy just shot out here. I'm, I'm on the corner of Georgia and freaking Chalamea Street. And what's the name of this place? Georgia and what? Uh, I'm on the corner of Chalamea and Georgia Street. Chalamea? Yeah. So what's going on there? There's a dude just got shot here at the intersection. He just got shot? Yeah. Spell Cali for me. Cali, K-A-L what? It's K-A-L-M-I-A Road, Northwest 900. Right beside a Taco Bell and a KFC. Morris Miller's across the street uh, and Eddie carry out is on the other side. Um, Georgia is 7800, um, Georgia Avenue 7800 Northwest. Dude, you need to get him freaking stop. What is the condition of the guy? He is bleeding like a mother He's bleeding bad. Okay, sir, listen to me for a second. All right. I keep you on the line, but I need to transfer you over to EMS to work some assistant medical assistance to this guy. Once the fire department is done talking to you. Sir, get his shirt down. Get his shirt ripped off. I need you to stay on the phone with me, okay? Hold on. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> You go right. You just stay with us. You stay with us. You stay with us. Dispatcher 62 with the exact location of the emergency. Okay. Um, the exact location. I'm like on the corner of Chalmia Road. Um, the road number is 900 and Georgia Avenue Northwest. Is it 9th in Georgia? Uh, 900. Is it 900 Georgia Avenue Northwest? Say it again. Put it on. Put it on. Put it on. Uh, right. Okay, sir. What's wrong? Dude, there's a dude here that just got shot. He's freaking. He's like, stay with us, stay with us, stay with us, stay with us. Okay, we have to, 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 we have Okay, how is he breathing? He is still breathing, but he's, uh, he's not doing too good. Okay, someone just pulled up and shot him. Yeah, yeah, just pulled up and shot shot and uh, pulled away. Neighbors told us that Mr. Charlotte was a friendly handyman willing to help out whenever needed. They also feared the randomness of it all. Huh? Oh. This, <laughs> this is just shocking. I'm just scared to go to work and all of that. It could be any one of us. Sitting on the front porch, it could be us, could be me, could be you, could be anybody. That would end up being the only murder by the snipers in Washington, D.C. And the shootings didn't stop there. Stop to 911, what's your emergency? Um, we've had a lady shot in our parking lot. This is Michaels in Fredericksburg. Okay. In the front of Spotsylvania Mall. Okay, is she breathing? I don't know. She is shot in her right side in her ribs. One what is your emergency? Yes, I am in front of Michaels and somebody's out here who needs some help. Okay, what's going on? 
I'm not sure. There was a loud crack, and she said she needs help, and she's lying down. Okay, it's an individual? Uh, yes. And you're at Michael's in front of the mall? Yeah, right in front of Michael's. Okay. There's someone standing there with her. Don't see you think blood. she's injured, or...? Uh, yeah, definitely injured. Okay, she hurt herself? I'm not sure. Some way? There was okay. a loud... No, it looks like she's been shot or something. She's been shot, yeah. She's, she's been, been shot. shot. I heard the, the crash. I heard the ho call for help, and I saw the car. You saw well, the car? I didn't, I didn't see the car. You didn't see the car? I saw... <laughs> I noticed that a car was squealing away, but I did not see it. Okay, I did not... anyone else? Can you ask anyone else that's um, around if they saw anybody? Did you see the car? Yeah, it just went so quick. That's what, what happened to me. We know what... What is it? I did... Oh, she's calling uh, her family. Um, no, same thing. We were aware that a car sped away, but we did not actually process what it was. It was now Friday, October 4th, 2.27 in the afternoon. A 43-year-old woman named Carolyn Sewell is shot while putting packages into her van. It is now 60 miles south of Montgomery County. Already, the fear of the snipers was spreading. Please, we have a lady that's been shot while I'm at Haverty's Furniture Store, Route 1. Got one. Okay. Vince, lock the doors. Lock the doors. Jeez, lock the doors. Where's Haverty's in front of the Spotsylvania Mall. All right, where's get, away the the get away from the window. Yes, get away from the window. You know that sniper thing is going on in, in Montgomery County. Folks, we have some breaking news right now. There has been a major development. We are listening uh, now to Chief Charles Moose that, announcing that there um, is, in fact, a link a between the Fredericksburg case uh, and the cases, the, um, the daytime the shooting, DC case, that is, and the cases night. in Montgomery County. Let's listen. Uh, certainly, again, that is uh, very disturbing. Uh, gives us a, a wider window to work with, a higher degree of recklessness by uh, these uh, suspect or suspects. Three of the killings have been linked to the same weapon, 223 rounds. So while now there's this shooting in Virginia, the police are saying, oh, the, the killings in Montgomery County and the murder of Mr. Charlotte in DC are connected. Mm -hmm crazy stuff. So we kind of knew what was going on, not why, obviously. And I think once you start stacking those up, it gets even more scary for people as they're hearing our newscasts. Yeah, it, it's chilling stuff. And here's more from uh, the now retired ATF agent Mike Bouchard talking about this. At what point did you realize this was a bizarre case? I mean, here it is 20 years later, we're still talking about it. Very few get to this level. Was it on that first day that you realized, whoa, this is, this is something highly unusual? Yeah, the first day we, we recognized it was really unusual, but the, um, I think the day after when we had some of the ballistics that came back from the ATF lab, then we knew a rifle was involved. So we knew someone who was shooting from a distance and that kind of got us on, on the road that, you know, a sniper could possibly be involved or snipers. So the ballistics is what really uh, convinced us that, you know, we've got to start looking, expanding our scene outward because uh, they're not shooting from close, close by the victims. Again, that's very chilling to hear, you know, a police official tell you this. Um, a crazy day. I mean, anybody who was somehow involved, October 3rd, 2002, um, and yet it was it was the very beginning. I mean, soon there was a hotline set up, right. several of them, in fact, that people could call uh, to police the FBI. And, and the what tips have were you. coming in like crazy. Oh, hundreds and hundreds. And that kind of got in the way of like tracking down the, the, the real ones the you know, the good tips. Um, there was also this whole talk about the white box truck, which from the very first day from when I was out there reporting yeah. that first day, they were already on to this white box truck, which, you know, took a lot of time and energy, which as it turned out. And we're gonna to talk to investigators from the inside, the behind the scenes, what was going on and, and how that kind of took on a life of its own, even though we know there were many, many times in some of these other murders where the Chevy Caprice had been spotted as well. Right, and yet all we were hearing and talking about was the white box truck for right. days. Right. All right, Melanie, so what's coming up, uh, our next episode? So next week, we'll be uh, really having a revealing interview with the wife of John Muhammad. She's going to talk to us a little bit about what she knew about her husband back then and, and really what it was like to be the sniper's wife. So you had a nice sit-down, intimate conversation yes, with her? absolutely. Good stuff. And, and we appreciate you tuning in, watching this, listening. Um, you have found us, but in case you're wondering, you know, 
all of the uh, podcast platforms has our uh, podcast here now, Three Weeks of Hell, the DC Snipers, available to you, also on our website, fox5dc.com. Yeah, make sure you share it with your friends. Thanks for tuning in.